Good morning, everyone. Um, we This is the November 3rd meeting of the Elementary School Building Committee. I am the chair, Kathy Shane. I see we have a few people who have not been with us before. Welcome, Rupert. My first um, task is to make sure the members of the committee, seeing that we have a quorum, can hear and we can hear them. So I am just going to call out your names based on where I see them on the screen and just indicate that all is well. Roger Wallace. Here and all is well. <laughs> Jonathan <laughs> Salmon. Good morning. Good morning, Jennifer. Here. Doug. Hi, I'm here. Paul. Present. Angelica. I, I can see you, Angelica, but we can't hear you. He's frozen. Okay. I'll Why keep going. Keep going. Simone? Here. Here. Simone? Here. Tammy? Here. Rupert? Here. And I don't... Rupert, I don't... Rupert is here and I can hear Angelica. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, we're missing a few people. Margaret will keep notes and we're going to start the meeting. Tim is back with us. We're starting the meeting um, with uh, Margaret sharing the agenda. And Paul, do you want to introduce um, uh, Robert Parent? You know, just- Oh, sure. Um, he is here with us and you can describe what his role will be. Sure. Yeah, so I'll do that. So Bob Parent is with us. Thank you, Bob, for being here. Uh, Bob is employed by the town as a capital projects manager. He's a professional engineer, has a oodles of background on buildings, uh, working in the public sector and in the private sector. Um, so if you want more information, we can talk about it, but he's been spectacular in supporting sort of projects that we need to bring to conclusion on the town side. So I've asked him to participate in this. Um, we don't have a membership slot for him, but he's going to bring his expertise to the table. Thank you. Uh, welcome, Bob. Thank um, you. I also want to introduce uh, Connor uh, Palazzo, uh, who is masquerading as Ksenia this morning. That is but... very weird. <laughs> you can change that. <laughs> we'll, we're gonna, we'll show you how to change that, Connor. Yeah. So Connor is working to support uh, Ksenia and myself on the project. So he, we wanted you to all meet him and to for him to start following along with the project. Um, so thanks, Connor, for joining. OK, Thank so you. I'm going to share the agenda. And it's actually not super dense agenda. Um, can everybody see that? I can. So I think that means yeah. everyone can. Great. Okay. So, um, Mark, Margaret, I'm sorry. I, I just, I don't believe we um, had met Roger before, at least the oh, Denisco my, team. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. You are Roger. Right. <laughs> Good morning. Roger Wallace is joining us from the school committee. And Roger, awesome. you might say a word. He was a longtime elementary school teacher. So he's bringing um, multiple roles to us. And Roger, am I right thinking you were at the last meeting, but you weren't on screen, right? I was at the last meeting. Yeah. I couldn't vote because I, had, I hadn't you had been all my officiated. Ah, uh, got it. Nice to meet you, Roger. Good to meet you. Roger's a legend. <laughs> yeah, everybody nods. Everybody knows in the school <laughs> who's had him as a teacher. All right. So um, we're going to start out with some fabulous news from the MSBA, which you've heard a little bit about. I'm going to do a schedule update. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about construction document process uh, we had a great sustainability subcommittee meeting this week, which we'll recap. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit and get some feedback from all of you on a question about uh, playground surfacing that we um, we want to get uh, feedback from the committee about. Uh, permitting update, I'm probably going to talk about as part of the schedule update. And then we have a couple of invoices. So that is the agenda. Um, so Kathy... 
MSBA news on reimbursement? Uh, yeah, so I, I sent everyone um, the press release and I sent it in words, but the the short good news that's excellent good news is we're um, the estimate from Margaret's team is we're going to get an additional $9.7 million from the grant toward our project, which will directly offset what we have to go out and ask the taxpayers for. We haven't gotten the, the final final. The MSBA will review the estimate, but they increased the cap on construction costs and the cap on site costs, which directly played into ours. This was good news across the state for a lot of schools. Um, we were in the batch of not yet bid. Um, so it's it's quite thrilling. You know, I was asked by a couple of residents, can you tell me what that means? And I said, well, the MSBA share day was up to about half. I mean, it's, it's a it's a giant increase from where they were at about 40 million before, a little bit over 40 million. Mm -hmm. So this this is a huge increase. The caveat, the, the the when they were released this, it does not increase the budget. It just increases their share of the budget. So they are with what we sent them in schematic design, what we sent them in the most recent still is the design of the school. So it wasn't an invitation to add a lot of things. <laughs> um, it was, uh, we're going to pay for more of your school than we were prepared to before. Yeah, I mean, the way the way I would think about this is we're still above the cap. There's still... Uh, cost of construction that's being excluded, but that number is smaller. So um, it it's it's wonderful news. I mean, I just it was like the day they called us to tell us it was like the best day ever. So um, I hope everybody is ex as excited about this as we are. And I also you know want to just say that um, as I've said I think before to this group. So this is the legislature taking action. Um, under pressure, right? The legislature gave the MSBA more money and the and then the MSBA was charged with figuring out how to sort of share it. So um, we're one of, this is this project is one of nine projects that got supplemental grants. Some of the projects that were already in motion are also getting funding. In fact, Tim, is, you, is your project in Swampscott getting any additional funding? Tim's on a building committee in Swampscott. Uh, we are getting more additional funding, uh, much to the delight of our town as well. Uh, not as much as Amherst, because we're at a different phase, but uh, mm -hmm. it's good news all around the state. Yeah. It's yeah. Fantastic. So any 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 project that I think was bid during COVID 20, before 22, 20 to 22, something like that, there's a hundred million extra. That's a separate pot that they're divvying up. So um, again, not as much. And we didn't get as much as the projects that are not yet have not received a project funding agreement. Um, they've raised the cap on that, but for future projects, that for are future the projects, yeah. right? Not yet, so not yet um, it's still awesome. It's, it's awesome. It's, it was it's overdue awesome. and fabulous news. So, so we thank your local representatives, Mindy and Joe, huge. Um, Really, they, they were outstanding on this. Right. I just realized that, Phoebe, I didn't see your picture. So I'm now I see you and I realize you're here. So I just want to make sure you can hear us and we can hear you. And I think Alicia may have joined us as well. She has. Yeah, I'm here. And Alicia? I'm not. I'm also here. Thank you, Kathy. Okay. Great. Thank you both. I'm sorry, I go by the pictures on the screen, so I don't have the names up and running. Okay, Bar Margaret, back to you. Okay, so I'm gonna uh, tackle the next item, which is to give you my now traditional schedule update. So I'm gonna share um, the same uh, little schedule diagram to talk about. Um, so, we're moving along, so we are here, right? So here we are. We had the sustainability subcommittee meeting on Halloween. Um, we're meeting today, um, launching into November. So um, the whole schedule has moved forward. So it's a couple of updates. Um, we have 
we're set, the design team is set to send the 60% CD set to the estimators on December 8th. That's the schedule, which means we'll have the estimates back. They take a little bit less time in this phase. We'll have those back before the holidays. Um, the So the design team is cranking on that and they can talk a little bit about that later in the meeting. In terms of this building committee, um, I don't believe this is on the schedule yet, but we'd, we'd like to have a meeting December 8th of this committee. Um, you know, I will say in this phase of the project, I do not anticipate that we're gonna need a meeting more than once a month. So we're gonna kind of keep looking forward as we do this. And if the eighth works for everybody, I'd also like to look forward to January and pick either January 12th or January 19th. So let me come back to that. Um, we're also in the process of set, scheduling a design subcommittee meeting on interior finishes with staff and on and and pulling the design subcommittee together on exterior finishes. That meeting date is not yet set, but it'll presumably be either the 28th, 29th, or the 30th of November, which is the week after Thanksgiving. So. Um, Again, we're st I'm still getting feedback from folks about their availability, but once we have those set, we'll let you set have that meeting. That's an in-person meeting, okay? Um, MSBA. So the MSBA just completed their uh, review of the, sorry, it's not the 60%, the design development review. <laughs> um, and we just received the comments, so we need to um, have a meeting with them. And uh, we need to respond to their comments, which were, you know, pretty, they're particular, um, but they are, uh, there weren't any uh, real issues. We have a design, the team has a design review meeting scheduled with them on December 7th. This is sort of a standard, standard meeting. Um, in terms of other design review that's going on, um, we're looking, we have a meeting set up on the 9th to look at site circulation on the site with the school staff, because this is a sort of, you know, how it's going to work during construction meeting. Um, we have uh, tentatively set up a meeting with the Disability Advisory Committee as part of the town's review on the 14th. And Danisco is in the process of scheduling some other meetings with DPW on the lift station. And then there'll be another meeting with food service. Those meetings are not yet set. And then finally on permitting, um, there is a first hearing with CONCOM on 1113. And we anticipate meeting with the planning board for the first time on uh, December 20th. Is Actually this CONCOM meeting is Tim, have I, have, I, have I got this? Is this December? It's December 13th, right? December, correct. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. And, and Margaret, are are those, is CONCOM confirmed? That's a confirmed meeting and planning board, you're still getting on the schedule? I'm just yeah. asking what you set up. Okay. We, Tim, I think CONCOM is confirmed and I'm not sure we reached out to the planning board yet. Correct. Uh, I've had initial conversations with uh, Jennifer Mullins, the permitting coordinator, uh, to establish the application date and format. And so the application is in mid-November, uh, but uh, we are not technically on the schedule yet. Okay. But we are planning to be, or hope to be. All right, I'm going to say 12-13 proposed. Okay. So that's kind of the update. Um, so... Um, any questions about that before I take that down? Yes. What CONCOM? Oh, Conservation Commission. Thank you. So uh, part of... And, Angelica, work... Angelica has her hand up also. Okay. Yeah. Part uh, of, let, let me just... Go ahead. Go ahead. So um, part of the work that's involved with this project is within the 100-foot buffer from Fort River. So it's required to go to, to con CONCOM. Angelica? Just real quick, uh, what is the Disability Advisory Committee and who's com who makes up that committee? Kathy, do you want to think you yeah, know they, more about this committee than I do? Um, they reached out to us to ask whether they could um, set up a meeting and they will 
I think Paul can say more of this. They typically yeah. get involved in any large project like this just to hear what we've set up. ADA compliance. They also, um, one of the members is particularly focused on uh, if you're visually impaired, are there wayfinding signals other than signs, you know, something you have to read. So it is a uh, back and forth with them, with the designers, just to tell them what has been built in both inside the building and outside the building. Yeah, so I'll just jump in. So Disability Access Advisory Committee, DAAC, uh, there's, it's an appointed body that's advisory, um, and they do bring a lot of um, expertise to the table. So it's really, really worth having that conversation with them, and they offer good insights from people who are often experienced in different uh, levels of ability. Um, and so at, um, and so it's we've really benefited from their expertise. I don't see any other hands. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna take this down, um, and I want to just talk a little bit about construct where we are, uh, where the design team is in the process. So, um, the the fact that we're moving to permitting tells you something about where we are overall. So the we've had a lot of meetings in the past that have been focused on. Uh, design decisions, both in this group and in the subcommittee meetings. So um, the intensity of that is past, right? The design team is now creating the bid documents that are uh, going to be used to, you know, buy the project in the, in the public realm. Um, so the updates will be a little bit less exciting <laughs> around design, <laughs> but they're going to be more focused on, you know, telling you about these coordination pieces. So I just want to sort of set the table for that. And also um, to remind everybody, um, if you didn't already know, the this project's being developed in as two packages. So there's an there's an early package. Um, sometimes, you know, these kinds of things are called enabling packages, which are, uh, which is going to, you um, allow the the poor soils on the site to be prepared for construction and then um, that early package is going to be bid i believe we're planning to bid it tim and rick i think it's in march right no uh, february 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 so that the early package will have will get bid in February, which will give us you know some sense of how we're doing relative to estimate, and then the the main building package will be built in the summer, with the intention of construction starting in uh, late July. So Tim and Rick, do you want to add, or Donna want to add anything about the construction document process and how you see it going forward? Uh, sure. I, I, I mean, yeah, I, I don't know. Okay. So, so it, it, you know, uh, as it relates to the overall project and the input of the building committee, obviously there's still a lot of decisions, discussions to be made, colors, uh, patterns. We have the playground we have to talk about. Um, so, so there is a lot of uh, remaining items to be discussed. We'll be talking about towards the end of construction documents, um, the FF&E and technology, making sure we fully understand all that. But a lot of the big push um, will be in the development of the documents for the contractor to be able to, to actually construct the building, right? So it's a lot of coordination and details, uh, technical details we'll that, that are required. We'll be having more of the smaller meetings with uh, the interested parties for really glamorous items like the lift station, Margaret. Um, <laughs> and, and, Perfect example. <laughs> you might want to explain what a lift station is. That That's the um, sewage ejection system that's going to take uh, the sewage from the building up to the gravity main in the street. Yes, it's not the elevator. It's way, way less exciting than the elevator. So. Okay. Um, so any questions about that? 
So what I would like to do then is just pin down. Oh, Kathy. Yeah, I just have one, um, you know, particularly because I learned these acronyms, the FF and E, that's when we're focusing on furniture, correct? Correct. Yep. And so yeah. Donna, Donna, that is happening sometime in the spring. Um, it doesn't go out. Uh, let me ask it differently. In the general contract to build the building, it doesn't have the furniture in it. So we 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 have Correct. a focused meeting on furniture and as you said, playground. So um as as we as Margaret and, and you all think of the schedule on a January, February, March, anytime we could get signals on when that might happen, because sometimes it's difficult to set up these meetings in advance. So it was just yes. that that's that that does, those decisions have not been made, but we will have a discussion about them. Yeah. So just just um, to put that into perspective, uh, both the we call it FF and E uh, furniture fixtures and equipment, and then the technology equipment. We have spent a lot of time. Uh, we've established the basis of design for those elements. We've worked really hard with the individual teachers within the building, uh, special education, uh, all of their needs so that we've identified the actual furniture and equipment and technology that will go into the building. But what we're gonna do, we will have another review, one final review before uh, construction documents are complete just to make sure nothing has changed. It has been a couple of years, we'll be 24 when we have this conversation, right? We start in 21. So um, a lot, a lot hopefully won't change, but we want to make sure that the intent is still there. Uh, but because we don't, we won't be receiving the furniture and technology until the end of construction, we don't want to go out to bid on those items uh, too early in the process, right? Um, furniture manufacturers change their lines all the time and everything else. So the, the real lift will be during construction when we pick the actual colors of the furniture, make sure that the models for the technology are still in place, et cetera. But we do wanna do one more check-in before we finish our construction um, documents to make sure that the outlets are where they should be and things like that. And then for the playground, I think we would and we can uh, start that process sooner rather than later. That is not contingent on manufacturers changing their models or anything like that. So I see Angelica's, Angelica's got her hand up. Uh, yeah, I had a similar question about glass because um, I know before we had uh, in the summer raised the issue about uh, talking about the possibility of either two-way mirrors or something to allow for observations that are not disruptive for um, classrooms, say like the ILC or other classrooms. And I know that we erased the issues and uh, Allison and some of the teachers had, and I think back then um, Superintendent Mike Morris had raised some issues about contracts and about some some concerns and so we wanted to figure out when we could uh raise that issue since we're getting to like the nitty-gritty of stuff and talking about glass um and interior design and when would be a meeting where we could figure out where what the latest is on that issue um i don't know donna what are your thoughts about that well, I, 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 we just 100% have to defer to the district. Um, our understanding is that any special observation within the classrooms um, is is not part of the project. So, I, I would just have to defer to the school department on that. I, Right now, it's not it's not incorporated, and if things do need to change, now would be the time. Um, so, I, um, Doug and Tammy, I don't know. I didn't see Allison on this. I, I don't know if you all 
um, we have an offline conversation with Angelica, I, however you guys want to handle this, but Um, Angelica, I think what I'd like to say is since we are having a meeting um, with staff to look at the interior colors, we can we revisit that with them? That, that meeting's coming up fairly soon and come back to you. That would be great. Okay. We'll put that on the agenda for that meeting. And if, if I'm not, it's not in the budget right now, I think is the other piece of this correct it isn't that's that's right yeah because of the feedback that the design team had gotten previously on the topic yeah. so because this has come up a couple of times and i think each time we said no um so i i think if this conversation happens we need to then put it to rest um close the loop on it yeah close the loop. I, I agree um, my recollection was that it wasn't done exactly because I know that last time we talked with Allison, there was a conversation to go check back on contracts, and then there was the movement and shift with the superintendent, um, so it kind of got it dropped off because of that, and Allison had even suggested the possibility of a furniture, and I know we also, one of our members uh, sent an email regarding best practices that include an example at Worcester, so we're happy, I'm, I'm happy to have um, the CTAC parent uh, who sent those letters uh, send some updates with some images from the schools in Worcester and some best practices to just for the staff to discuss about some possibilities of providing for observations from parents that are also not disruptive of classroom practices and within contracts as well. Yeah, I mean, my recollection of the last conversation was that we we did talk and I remember Allison might have been the one who suggested this. We did talk about the possibility of using furniture within the room to do that, which seemed like something that would be agreeable to everyone. But I do agree now that we have Doug here. Um, it, we, we need to revisit it. So thank you for bringing it up, Angelica. Okay, I don't see any other hands. I want to just, before we turn to talking about the good stuff, I want to just get these meetings pinned down. So again, recommending that we have a meeting in December, uh, on December 8th. Can I just check and make sure we'd have a quorum? So it would be at 8.30 on the 8th. Can I confirm that we've got a quorum for that time? Roger? Yes. Roger, yes. yes. Kathy, yes. Jonathan, yes. Jennifer, yes. Doug is nodding. Rupert, where are you? Angelica, yes. <laughs> Tammy, yes. Can you tell me that date again, please? December 8th. I, I sent it out in the email, so I don't know whether people immediately, but Margaret can put a hold on everyone's calendar. Yeah, we put the hold on. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, I can probably be there. Alicia, Phoebe. Um, yeah, I'm good to be there. Uh, yes, for, yes for Paul. Yes for Paul. Okay. Phoebe? I will have to get back to you. Okay, but I think we have a quorum. So you're going to get an invite for that. And then the next one would be um, setting a meeting for either the January 12th or the 19th for this group. So Margaret, rather than do that now, why don't we quickly do a poll on those two dates so we can get okay. on with it? Okay, we can do that. So everyone should that. just look at their calendars and I will send out, okay? All right, so then the next item on the agenda was construction document meetings process update. So I'm gonna turn the floor over to uh, Denisco to give an, give an update. Um, I will say, Margaret, that uh, what you covered in your schedule update uh, gives us most of the background that we need for the update on construction documents. As you mentioned, we are going towards a 60% uh, estimate and review with the MSBA. Uh, which is sort of concurrent with the packages that we are preparing to go before Conservation Commission and the Planning Board. Um, so, at, you know, I am repeating a lot of what you said. That we are moving from the design phase into the documenting phase and checking off all the boxes. Um, you know, some of the last major decisions are going to be made at those uh, building and interior and site uh, subcommittee meetings that you have on the schedule for the last week of November. Uh, but we are uh, just moving along. And uh, another aspect is the early site package. Um, 
which will be going out to bed early in the year. Um, and yeah, and know. it's at sixty percent. That draw those set of drawings and specifications will be pulled out uh, to be evaluated as a standalone package. Uh, it's good practice to do that for cost estimating, and uh, MSBA requires it for the sixty percent review to see what those early packages will look like. So that's we're starting to divide that scope of work up between the two contracts now. Do you can you guys uh, just recap for everybody? I didn't do a very good job, I think, of sort of stating sure. what was in that package. Sure. So imagine a line drawn 30 feet off the south end of the building. And uh, that portion of the site will be prepared by a separate contractor doing earthwork and soil improvement work. So they will be doing uh, site demolition, which would be removing the old parking lot paving in that area, the uh, comfort station that's there, the ball field lights. They will be stripping and stockpiling the loam from the lawn areas. They will be installing rammed aggregate piers. That's a soil improvement to, to basically stiffen the soil. It's like jamming pins in a pin cushion and making it harder. And then after that, they will be uh, overburdening the building footprint to preload to compress the soils. And what that will get the general contractor is not quite a shovel ready, uh, foundation ready site, but a site that um, when the general contractor starts in August sometime, he'll start pushing around the dirt that was uh, weighing down the footprint and begin excavating for his foundations when the weather's still favorable. Yeah, and all of that is, uh, I was just gonna say, leading up to the fact that this is gonna get very real uh, in March when that fence goes up. And so that's why we have that meeting scheduled next week so that everyone yeah. fully understands how the site is gonna operate uh, once, once things start moving. Exactly. Bob and Perrin has his hand up. Yeah, Rick, one quick question. With the initial work, is there going to be preloading and monitoring that'll have to continue to determine when they could move to the next phase? Uh, there will be uh, monitoring platforms and preload okay. and monitoring by <clears throat> our Geotex OTO. Yep. And they'll be monitoring it. They anticipate that the overburden just needs to be in place for three months. Okay. So if you imagine prepping the footprint from east to west, they'll start, they'll strip the topsoil, start installing the ram aggregate piers at the east end and then overburdening it as they go. So that by the time they're done, the next contractor could start at the east end to begin excavating for foundations so we think it should be pretty seamless okay there wouldn't be a, a a potential where they might have to wait longer for additional settlement before they could proceed most we likely. don't we don't think so but by going out to bid in uh february, february to be on site march april uh we'd have the chance to make adjustments to the general contractor's contract so we don't promise something that he can't get. Good. Thank you. Rick, do you want to say a couple words about the gas line? So there is a gas oh. line that needs to be relocated also as part of this enabling work, although it'll be by the gas company. So Berkshire Gas needs to relocate uh, a gas line, which conveniently takes a diagonal route right through the footprint of the new building because when they installed their new gas line they did it where they didn't have to dig up the parking lot or anything that would have disturbed the school at the time well this is going right through where we're going to be installing deep foundation work so obviously the pipe has to be moved and we finally uh, found somebody that's right now preparing um, the cost for the gas company to do this work so the gas Berkshire gas will excavate, install the gas line and backfill. Uh, and it will be done before the 
early site package. Uh, the gas lines has got to be out of the way, say, March 1st or April 1st. Uh, once we get and the town agrees to their back charge for this gas service work, if you will, they can perform it at any time uh, coordinating with the school operation. So they have to basically attach to the main somewhere near the street and attach to the main somewhere at the building, but just get the loop out of the way. But in terms of contracting and cost, um, even though Berkshire Gas will be doing this work, Rick, I assume that we can expect that a bill will be coming to the town of some That's substantial value. Absolutely, it, it's it's like I believe that answer does have in the budget some quote utility back charges. We do. So, so this wouldn't be a heck of a lot different than if you're building a new building with gas, and that would be the cost for them running the the line to the building because of because the line is between the street and the building's meter the gas company must do this work we didn't have the ability to make it part of a, a contractor scope and the other thing that's in terms of uh contracting and money is that come January, we're going to start preparing to bid uh, the early package. Come February, we'll probably be bidding it and looking at contracting so that they can get started on their work as soon as the weather allows in the spring. So the, the contracting methods for to get deep in the weeds with people on the municipal end, we've done this most often under chapter 30, 39M, horizontal construction for the early site package and not chapter 149. So it will be a different contracting uh, procedures. And um, we'll be look, reaching out, Paul, to see if the town's got a preferred form of contract for horizontal construction. If not, we have one that we've used. Okay, so I see. That's a, that's a, that sounds good. Simone oh, would be sorry. key to that, Rick. Okay. Right. I see Jonathan has his hand up, Bob and Kathy. So Jonathan, you're next. And just just to clarify, this is work that's being done to keep the gas available to the existing building Correct. through the next uh, whatever it is year and a half, um, because it's in the way of the phasing of the new work. That's correct. And after that, it will be removed, capped, and, and there will be no more gas to the site. Kathy, I think you were next. Uh, yeah, mine is, I think Rick and, and Senya answered it, but in terms of the cost of this, we will get a price tag. And in theory, it's already covered under the answer contract, but if it's not, some of this would be borne by the town. Is that how this will work? So what... No, I, I don't. It, it won't be borne by the town. It's there's a there's a value in the budget. It it may or may not be the right number, right? I mean, we we always carry a number for utility relocations. Um, if it's more or less, that just changes money within the budget. So if if it's less, the money goes back in contingency. If it's more, we take money out of contingency. Um, but I think the the immediate question is how to how to manage the flow of money this is the question that berkshire gas is asking is who's going to write the check and uh, we need to have some work to do it sounds like with simone to figure out what that will look like so the town will pay it but it will be uh potentially reimbursed through the msba if they in, in consider a, it reimbursable in a sense it will be the first check that the town writes toward construction of the new school Okay. And as far as budget goes, not only did Answer have a utility re re relocation line, but it also lives in the design development budget. Our estimators have had priced relocating this line, so it's not a new cost. Thank you. That's right. that was my question. Thank you. So if it's if it's paid by the town, then it reduces the construction cost by the value that they were they carried. Bob Parent has his hand up. Just a quick question. Do you have a rough value of that initial contact contract? You just wanted to try to get it in context to the overall contract. 
we haven't they haven't given us not yet okay okay are, are you talking about a rough value of the early site package that's correct Oh, yes, sorry. actually, actually, that that does exist in the design development cost estimates. It was pulled out separately, so we can find that for you in the information that's already gone. Bob, I can there. send you the um the estimate Great. so you have the I whole thing. Curious, are we talking about hundreds of thousands or you know low low millions or low millions, millions. low millions? Okay. Yeah. Okay. No more hands. All righty. Update from the Sustainability Subcommittee. Bob, your hand's still up. Jonathan, do you want to, as the chair of that subcommittee, you want to give a quick update? Sure, I can give a quick update. Um, and, and hopefully someone will uh, pipe in if I forget. It was, a, it was a conversation about many things. So if I drop something out, someone else feel free to pipe in. Um, it, as uh, Kathy said, it, it was a really great meeting. We had a, a lot of uh, very engaged folks um, from both the design team and uh, our committee and the, and the community. Um, and, you know, we talked through uh, you know, everything from how the, the latest round of, um, you know, statewide uh, energy code changes are, have impacted things and how the design team has adapted to uh, you know, broad conversations about uh, plug loads and, and, uh, and, oh, Kathy, I know I'm forgetting something. <laughs> uh, but, it, but it was, it was a good conversation. You know, it's clearly not the end. There's still more to discuss. Um, uh, and there was a, you know, interesting conversation about, you know, make, going back and, and reconfirming, you know, some of the schedules uh, that some of the energy modeling is built on. Um, and I think some of that's already happened just from, from what I've heard through through emails, so uh, I I was really happy uh, with the with the process. It was a uh, great conversation. Uh, what I would just add, um, a lot of the materials are in um, the packet for that meeting, but one of the concerns that was raised, and and we're double checking, is we have to do to understand the potential energy need of the building. We have to know how the building is going to be used. And, and there was a lot of work done, people probably remember, on, on how much after hour, how much on weekends, how much in the summer. And Donna has sent that scheduling back out to Doug and Tammy and Rupert, you know, just to verify, because it's a issue if you build a fabulous building, it gets used. Um, build it and they will come. <laughs> you know, so to, regardless of how currently. So, and that's, that's primarily an issue of how much so how many solar panels do we need to offset the electrical cost of the building and then within that it's how many monitors within the building do you need sub monitors so you know where you're using the energy so there, it was a very rich conversation particularly for me as a, a lay person because it was using words that i could understand um <laughs> and but one one of the ideas and recommendations that's come out of the person who's doing the checklist for us is that early on at the school level, we put together a committee, and Rupert was in this too, that is saying, okay, here's the general policy on use of energy, but also get the kids and the teachers involved saying, you know, one of the things we're trying to do is being uh, sustainable, and it would be an on-the-ground um, way of getting people excited about this. It wouldn't be just rules. Uh, so that's something clearly until we get to the building, um, we won't be setting that up. But it was a, a recommendation on other schools that have done this, that when they had an internal ongoing group of users, um, it, it was an asset for the building. And I see Allison has joined us. So I just wanna make sure that Allison can hear and be heard. Allison, could you just signal? Welcome. Hi, I'm Allison. Hi, Allison. So I, I think, that, that, oops, sorry. Go ahead, Kathy. No, so I think that was one of the things that came out of this, Jonathan. This is an ongoing process. And the checklist that was done for us um, was off of schematic design and design DD phase. And they will be, it will be an ongoing list as a construction document. So we have a, another architect team, a double 
looking looking over various things, making recommendations. And one of this is this user group. Go on, Jonathan. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> and just and just by way of context, I think it's you know kind of helpful for the broader community to know that you know as a town building, it needs to be net zero. Um, but it's also <laughs> it's also for better or worse breaking ground at the the state level because it's the first project that's gone through some of the state's new energy modeling processes. Um, and so we have a lot of really competent uh, specialists working with us uh, to get us through that that new process at the state level. It was for me, it was very impressive because it's. Uh... I shouldn't quite use the word guinea pigs, but the, the back and forth. It's not that far off, though. <laughs> it's back, and off. Forth, back and forth with the energy models with the state on, are you sure? And they said, oh, no, no, we haven't written some of the code yet. We'll fix that. We'll fix that. So there's been a lot of back and forth on uh, this new building code on how it affects real buildings. Um, and uh, the, t the team is right in the middle of it. It was it. it incredibly impressive to see um, the level of coordination with the state and and then with the modeling for our own project. Um, it was exciting and uh, confidence building at, on both things. Okay. It was a great, it was a great meeting. So, sorry, I've got uh, okay, so now we're going to pivot to engineered wood fiber versus pour in place rubber. So, um, so the, I'm sure that you all have heard, we've had comments uh, during public discussion about what um, Denisco Design and their landscape architect have proposed about um, the use of the material underneath the playground equipment where there's the potential for falls. Oh, I just want to say I see Allison has joined us. So Alice can Allison, can you see us? Yeah. Can you hear us? Okay. Oh, good. I, I welcomed her and she Oh great. I had her is missing. So um so you know I think this is this is a a challenging discussion because there's a lot of different aspects to the decision and what I what I want to do we'd like to have a discussion here amongst the building committee members and hear your perspectives. Um, right now, what the design is showing is what's called poured in place rubber, and I want to want to make sure that everybody knows what that is. Does anybody not know what poured in place rubber is? So this is the kind of rubber surfacing, solid rubber surfacing that you often see under playground equipment. Um, does anybody not know what that is? Okay, so, and then engineered wood fiber is a kind of, uh, it's it's a, it's like a wood chip material, but it's sort of at a high, it has a higher standard. So again, right now, the design team has showed port in place rubber, and we've talked about this a couple of times. It, I mean, it is currently, for better or worse, the industry standard. There are a bunch of different issues though, um, trade-offs. So Kathy asked me to kind of put together a summary for the committee of the different issues. And um, I'm gonna show you that summary, it's in the packet. Mm -hmm. um, and what I what I'm wanna do is I wanna kind of go briefly through the summary. I wanna have Denisco speak a little bit about why they and their landscape architect are recommending the, the port in place rubber. And then I want to hear comments from the committee about this and have a brief discussion. So I'm going to just quickly pull up, um, pull up my memo, which again, it's in the packet if it's easier for you to look at it that way. And because of the way my screen is, there we go. Okay. So can everybody see this lovely item? So um, what I did here, and again, this is, I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm doing this as the owner's project manager trying to summarize this for the committee, right? So I'm not doing this as an expert on this, but I did some research. Actually, Kathy did a ton of research. Kathy, thank you, which she shared with me. And then I sort of tried to pull it together and, and um, summarize it. So um, 
actually, I'm going to start with the second page here because this is sort of a good, uh, this is a, this is an expert group. Okay. So here's the Children's Environmental Health Network had this pretty nice summary of the two items. So engineered wood fiber benefits disadvantages. So um, super simply, it's easy to install. It provides good impact absorption. It stays in place better than loose fill disadvantages made from completely new wood can hide insects and other pests. Microbial growth can occur. Uh, it's more expensive than wood chips, although way less expensive than poured in place rubber. And it, it takes more maintenance and those costs kind of accrue over time. So the poured in place uh, rubber, um, it's, it's easier to use with mobility, ADA mobility devices. So if you're in a wheelchair, if you're in some kind of thing that's got to move across the surface, um, it provides great greater impact and shock absorption, which I believe we will hear from Danisco as kind of the main reason that it tends to get specified for playgrounds. Um, it's impact absorption yeah. is consistent, i.e. it doesn't change. The material is more stable than the engineered wood fiber. Animals do not find it appealing. Um, you can imagine what that means. Generally low maintenance costs, easily repaired. The disadvantages are as expensive. It's what we have in the budget now. It's got to be kept clean and swept regularly. Um, here's the nugget. Right, so it is. It can be made of recycled tire, tires, among other materials, and that can contain. Here they mention VOCs, but it can also contain what's called PFAS. I don't even remember what PFAS stands for, but I mean th these are that these are you know materials that you don't ideally want. You don't want to have on a playground, right? So this is the the nugget. Um, you know, just to go back to my summary, um, you can imagine what this looks like. So on the ADA compliance side, um, the the engineered wood fiber can be made to be accessible, but it's a whole lot harder, right? Whereas the rubber is a smoother surface. From a safety perspective, and here I'm I'm using safety to to define the issue that is around impact. Okay, so maybe this should be qualified to say impact. So um, the the pour in place rubber is just a, a whole lot better because it's it stays in place and it, it is more resilient. This can be, the engineered wood fiber can be safe, but it takes a whole lot of maintenance to, to make sure that it's not getting, I'm sure you've all seen playgrounds where this material gets scraped out, you know, in areas where there's a lot of use like under swings, right? Um, installation cost, it, it, there's just no comparison. The port in place rubber, which again is what we have in the budget is expensive, um, but it is the industry standard, you know, kind of because of the safety issue up above. Uh, the engineered wood, wood fiber is, you know, financially, a great deal as a first cost in terms of installation cost. Permeability, so this has to do with how much the material lets water through to absorb rather than producing runoff. Um, they're both permeable. Um, the arguably, it, it, ha it actually has a little bit more to do with what's underneath it than what's on top of it. Um, so in this case, the the difference is small, but the engineered, the, the pour in place rubber is a little bit more permeable. It, it's actually, if I can interject, uh, our stormwater engineers actually apply a higher permeability rating to the to pour it in place than the wood chips, finding that it, yeah, because of the substrate, it, it, it ponds. So it's a different, they would run numbers differently if it was the, area was wood chips. Yeah, exactly. So, which is an issue for the CONCOM because the, the again, the design that is being taken to CONCOM right now is assuming the port in place rubber. And if we went to engineered wood fiber, it would be a slightly lesser permeability. Cleanliness, I mean, I think you everybody gets the issue. Animals like wood chips <laughs> and um, it's kind of harder to keep that material clean. 
care and maintenance. Um, th this is, I think, a big one for the district in the sense that um, although the installation cost for the engineered wood fiber is lower, a lot lower, um, it just takes a lot more maintenance. Snow removal, um, I mean, uh, you can remove, obviously remove uh, snow from the port and place server. You, ha you do have to do it carefully. It's really tough with the wood chips. And then lifetime costs, um, you know, as related to the maintenance up above, um, the maintenance cost is lower. So, you know, this is, you know, again, the summary, I gave each of the colors a score. I added them up at the bottom, but I think it's the color, just looking at the colors that kind of give you the overall sense. However, none of these score the issue of the VOC and the PFAS, which is really hard to get a handle on because you don't generally know um, because of the public bidding regulations, you don't have as much control as you would like to have over um, uh, uh, where it's coming from and whether it's going to have any of those contaminations. Now, from my perspective, there's been a lot of scrutiny on this issue in the industry. And I believe that the industry is you know, cleaning up its act about where they're getting their ma the materials for, from for the port and place rubber, but I can't give you a guarantee about this. So um, with that, I wanted to just ask um, someone from the Danisco team to talk a little bit about your perspective about why the use of port and place rubber and why you think that's, that is you have, that's what you've used in the design. Well, oh. Go, go ahead, Rick. Sure. Uh, I can't, well, this is a, a discussion we always have with our user groups and our clients, you know, when we're going to design. And for the reasons that you mentioned, uh, you know, we start off suggesting the port in place and virtually everybody uh, has some experience with wood, wood fiber in one way or another. And we haven't had anybody request uh, the wood fiber and everybody's been satisfied with the port in place rubber as you alluded to port in place rubber is tunable they actually vary the thicknesses for per fall hazard uh, the substrates thicker at jungle gyms or where the fall hazards might be higher than the bottom of a slide or something like that it's a much more precise material. Uh, like I said, our our uh, civils like it for for stormwater calculations because of the stone that's under it and the drainage. It uh, rainwater runs right through it, so it doesn't affect. Uh, it doesn't act like pavement at all. Uh, we've seen some installations we've revisited after uh, 10, 12 years, and they've been. Uh, just as serviceable as they were that the, the, the day that they were put down. Uh, we've been more, I personally, in my role on a building committee, it heard about PFAS, but only from synthetic athletic surfacing standpoint. And there's been a lot of discussion on it there. And we haven't heard anything similar on the port and place surfaces uh, at this point in time. Great, Rick, thank you. Tim, did you want to add anything to that? Uh, no, I mean, that uh, covers our experience with it. Okay, so that being said, um, I can I, could the folks on the committee comment on this, what your perspective is? Because we've, this was presented early on. We heard public comment about it. We've never had a chance to circle back and get your thoughts, but this is this is the opportunity because we do, if we're going to change direction here, we do want to provide that direction to Danisco sooner rather than later. I see Angelica's hand is up. 
Thanks, Margaret. I just wanted to thank you for that chart and that information. This is a really important issue, so I appreciate it, like you and Kathy doing that research and the thoughtfulness involved, because um, this is a really hard set of trade-offs, and I'm glad we're having this conversation because it is some trade-offs here. Um, you know, um, on the one hand, uh, there is some really alarming concerns, as you say, about using of recyclable, you know, rubber materials that may contain carcinogens. And that's really a, a big challenge. And that fact that this is made out of rubber and we're trying to move away from fossil fuels and have a, you know, a building that is, uh, that, that is something that represents uh, net zero and you know, trying to build something that's environmentally sustainable. At the same time, there are some differences for ADA compliance that are really a challenge as well as upkeep as well as safety. And so I'm eager to hear what other people think about balancing those two. I think, like you said, um, maybe the industry is cleaning up its act. Um, I don't hold much faith in industry cleaning up act when it comes <laughs> to using carcinogens. But nonetheless, um, it is, it, it, you know, past experiences that I've had with uh, engineered wood chips or fibers, it's, it's, it might be more ADA compliant, but it certainly is, it's a difference. You know, it is a difference. And most of the accessible playgrounds I've seen have a poured in rubber surface at the same time. That is still really alarming to, to know that uh, we know from also anecdotal experience that the heat issue is a huge issue. Um, I believe the poured in, in place surface is the same as Groff Park. And all parents who have kids going to that splash pad in the summer know very well that it is a challenge to keep those crops in place so that the kids are not taking them off and then having these surfaces be super, super hot. It's horrible. So I, I would love to hear also more from the engineers about what solutions or what ways we can mitigate some of those if we make one choice over the other, because both have um, both are like balanced in terms of the trade-offs for me right now. Uh, Mr. Parent. Bob, you're muted. If you don't mind, I'll weigh in on this topic first. I think everything that you've summarized, Margaret, is 100% correct. Um, and I make my comments as a former owner, operator, maintainer of playgrounds, as well as designer. Uh, when I was I was DPW director in East Longmeadow for a number of years, I was city engineer in Holyoke. So I, you know, I was very involved in a number of park projects. Um, one item that I flagged to Margaret, I just texted you a link to it. There are draft, proposed draft changes to the state AAB regulations that were put forward back in 2018. And for some reason, they haven't advanced. But at that point, the AAB was going to specifically state that engineered wood fiber was not an accessible surface. Because it the reality is, for accessibility purposes, it is almost impossible to maintain it in a continual state of accessibility. You know, port in place fiber is, it's an interesting pro, I mean, port in place rubber is an interesting product. It's ugly when it goes in, if you've ever been there when it's installed. You know, it's not a very worker safety or environmental friendly product. That's, that's a given, but it does provide the accessibility. One thing that I've seen done on a couple of projects is somewhat of a hybrid solution where you try to mix engineered wood fiber and poured in place. Since you don't need to maintain 100% accessibility to all portions of the playground, um, I've seen poured in place done with pathways or certain portions of the playground done in poured in place and other portions done in with the EWF. You know, so that may be a compromise type approach. Thanks, Bob. That's helpful. Phoebe? Hi. Um, so I I guess I have more questions than, than opinions at this point. Um, I'm wondering if we have sort of expert advice either way, either from the, you know, you said um, that there was going to be meetings at a later date with uh, people who really specialize in accessibility. Um, and I'm wondering if we also have the ability to kind of ask uh, ask the experts, you know, like the people who specialize in these things, both about the environmental impacts, more so the impacts of the materials on our kiddos. Um, and so, uh, you know, and what is our, does this have to be decided 
today? Can we wait to get expert advice? Like, what is that timeline? When do when does this kind of decision have to be nailed down? Absolute have to. Um, I just, I just am feeling. I would like to have a little bit more uh, input from people who really, really know and understand what the long-term ramifications um, of this kind of thing are. So let me start with the last question about timing. So we are not deciding this today, okay? I mean, conceptually, it was decided when Danisco um, presented this originally, but this committee has never taken it up as a specific issue. And um, we, this, it seemed, this seemed like the right moment. So we're definitely not deciding it today. I'm assuming, my hope was that we would identify some issues that you all wanted to hear more about, hear your opinions about it at the moment and revisit it in December. Now at that point, I don't think we should be going past that moment to give Danisco direction if we're changing the design because they are going down the path, developing their documents based on this assumption, you know, and as Rick pointed out, even the conservation, the, all of these things start to become very kind of knit together and integrated. If we change to engineered fi wood fiber, that starts to change what we say to CONCOM and that, you know, that meeting is coming up in early December. So that, the submission for that meeting is three weeks before the meeting. Right. So those calculations are going to CONCOM. What's the date, Tim? November 22nd. So there's a, a series of stormwater mitigation calculations that are using uh, poured in place rubber as uh, a surface area that are part of the overall scope of the project. So I think it would be, well, things change, but you also have to go back to CONCOM after that. So it could be a consequence. So Phoebe, to speak to the expert issue, um, you know, I think that I, I'd be curious. <laughs> the, I think the nugget of this is that there's a fundamental discrepancy, which Angelica and Bob have done well in outlining here. Um, we're, even if we take out the cost issue, right? The fundamental conflict here is between the safety or lack of safety of the of the corn place rubber in terms of cont potential contamination with the accessibility. I mean, that's the nugget of it, right? Overlaid on that, I would say there is the issue of um, the maintenance cost. But I suspect that if it if there are really clear decision here, um, which there I think there is not. And the maintenance cost is sort of a sort of second level of concern. It's a concern, but it's it's probably not the driver. Um, although Doug and Rupert may disagree with me about that. Um, there are, in, in doing this research, I mean, I'm happy to sort of do more research, but I will say in doing more research, this there's the opinion on these things is very split around the, 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 this issue between accessibility and con and contamination. So I'm happy to do more research. I'm happy to summarize more research, but I will tell you there isn't, it. there's, you're either on team, um, it's contaminated or you're on team, it needs to be accessible. So let's hear from others and circle back to that. So, um, and uh, Doug, you had your hand up and yep. Kathy, and then we can circle back to Ange Angelica, is your hand still up? Okay, so Doug. Thank you. So I think that for me, the, the question I wanna ask a little bit about is, um, uh, you know, you sort of mentioned in the bid process, there's limits on, on what you can and how you can constrain, uh, you know, the, the vendors around the, this topic. And so I'm sort of curious as to, to what level of, of impact can we have? In other words, to, um, you know, if we would go with a port in place rubber, um, you know, can we put metrics on it that, that they need to, you know, comply to a certain level as part of their bid um, or, or uh, and, and the, you know, sort of resulting product, you know, if we have it tested or, or we have 
some metrics that we can put on it. Uh, can we do that as part of the bid process? Is it allowed? I mean, obviously it makes things potentially more expensive and, and obviously more complicated if there's a, a, a sort of performance standard that we are imposing in a bid, but can we even do that? And if so, to what extent? And I mean, I think that, you know, the harder question is like sort of what are the, the sort of right numbers and, and restraints we might put on it, but I'm just curious about what are the possibilities? I think it's a great question and I don't know the answer to it. I'm wondering if Denisco has any thoughts about this. Uh, we have not yet had to look at metrics for uh, the raw materials were poured in place, so I couldn't comment. Basically, yes, to answer your question, establishing that as part of a criteria to evaluate products as an equal to your specification under Massachusetts bidding laws is uh, is doable. Um, the only thing that we are bound by is specifying products that can be uh, met by uh, three three manufacturers at least, or else it becomes a proprietary issue, which there's time to do that. So yeah, with more research, it might be possible if someone's making a product that they can guarantee uh, whatever metric uh, isn't present. I think you're, you know, like asbestos free might be such, such a, such a statement, but I don't know if there's agreement on the compounds that people should be trying to keep out of the product yet. I think there's some 6,000 PFAS compounds of which testing is only available on a handful of them. Doug, that's a great question. Um, so I see uh, Kathy's hand went down, Angelica's hand went back up, and Jonathan also has seen it. Oh, Kathy's hand went up back up. Where Kathy, why don't we take you next? Uh, take Jonathan first, because I, I want to, I've got something else that I want to bring up. Okay. Um, Jonathan and then Angelica. So I, I would be interested to know more about whether or not as Doug has stated, whether it's possible to specify a variety of this that's, you know, inherently better than other varieties. You know, I, I don't, it's not a product that I've ever had to specify in my practice before. So I, I don't have a lot of personal understanding about it. Um, and I would be curious if, if, if there are some materials that are better than others and, and could that uh, be something that we could get in a, a specification um, I will also add that, you know, to me, accessibility is an important uh, component to this. Um, and real quick, uh, Murray, when you were putting up your comparisons, did I see that the engineered wood fiber actually has arsenic in it? Or is that the older style stuff? You were scrolling kind of fast and I saw the word arsenic, but I wasn't sure where that landed. You know, this is, so some of this material is from uh, product websites. Um, I, I tried hard to not take material from someone who was selling something. Yeah. <laughs> um, I did come across that comment. Um, I, you know, again, relative to uh, Phoebe's question, there's a lot of different marketing stuff out there. Um, and I would imagine the arsenic thing is a little bit like what we're discussing relative to the PFAS is right. you have to you figure out. You wouldn't want to trade one, one potential contaminant for another. That's not, that's not a, a exactly. valuable trade to me. Yeah. And we have plenty of fields in this town that are, you know, from a history of apple orchards already contaminated with arsenic. Exactly. John, you. you're all set. So Angelica and then Kathy. I think on a similar point, um, because I was also, when I was doing, looking up these things, uh, it was very confusing to wade through the information of what is AD compliant? Oh, but it's a, a website trying to sell that. So right. if it's possible when you do the next iteration of the report, if we can hyperlink some of the studies or, mm -hmm. or the things that you have found, like the one that Robert mentioned, because I'm really eager to hear that that point was really solid. And I would like to to know more like that about from 
not uh, advertising perspective, but about 80 compliance from different sources, because uh, that I think that's a really important point as well. Yeah, and actually, that's why I added the um, Children's Environmental Network piece to that, because, I mean, they're one of the few who are not selling anything, right? And I think their summary is, is which is the second page of that memo, is is super easy. But they're, they're also, I would say, they're not, they're not saying one or the other is better. They're just saying these are the choices communities have to have to weigh to make this call, right? Okay, so Kathy had her hand up. Paul has his hand up. Kathy, how about you? Yeah, I'll just be quick. Um, Jonathan, you're right. You saw the the word arsenic, and it was how the engineered wood is treated, and it would be a, a question of how it was treated. And if they don't treat it, then their trade off was then you get insects, um, and you can get mold, so insecticide. So it's it's not like either any of these choices are completely free. One of the things, you know, on maintenance that um, when I was looking at this, the to get any kind of resilience under the engineered wood, you have to go quite deep um, and in terms of the amount of it and then maintain it, keep doing it in. And uh, I, I would be hesitant to say that we've been, I would, make a different statement. We have not been great at maintaining surfaces in in our in whether they're school playgrounds or other playgrounds. And this stuff does not have the long-term maintenance. So I think it's a real concern. So my only other piece, Bob mentioned that you could have a mixed approach. Right now, all of the playground, it, we have a pretty big surface area that's PIP, um, poured in place, um, could part of it be one surface and another part be another. So where you were less likely to get falls or where you weren't looking for the wheelchair access. And I know that's a design question. And the new thing I heard today was uh, permeability. Um, the fact that we're better on stormwater with, with PIP, I think is a major plus because we're in an area we need to worry about water a lot. Um, and so I just think that's, there are all these pluses, but but that's a huge plus or a minus. Um, and I, I there's an article today in the Times about Hoboken, which has better stormwater control than they used to. So they weren't flooded the way Brooklyn was with the most recent storm. And having been in Hoboken when it was flooded before, it was boats in the street and they didn't have boats in the street this time. And it was the, both their parks, their streets, and their stormwater that made a difference. So I'll stop, Paul. Paul? Yours. Well, thanks. Um, yeah, I, I don't have a strong, I don't know enough to have an opinion about this, first off. Um, I think the, um, I worry a little bit about the hybrid solution that sometimes hybrid solutions bring you the worst of both worlds. You have the same maintenance issues that you had before. I think in this situation, we have competing goods and competing bads that we're going to have to weigh. There's not going to be a clear cut winner. I don't think we're just going to have to make a decision. We can't be paralyzed by too much information, trying to, there's always going to be more information. And Margaret, to your point about sort of finding neutral parties, I always, am, um, it, it, you need a critical eye because a lot of these nonprofits are funded by industry sources. So, yeah. you know, it might be the, you know, the committee to protect children and, and, and animals, and then it's funded by the plastics industry or something like that. Yeah. Um, so I think that um, the things I care about, uh, the initial cost seems to favor wood chips, um, but, and I, I'm much more sensitive to the ongoing maintenance cost and ability to maintain. And we all, if you have kids, you've, They've been on playgrounds and you've seen the playgrounds with wood chips that have been, they quickly deteriorate into hard, you know, rock hard surfaces, which what's the point then? Um, and I and I think maintenance is, is a challenge for us generally, and that's it's going to continue to be a challenge. Um, so I look at, com compare the initial cost to the ongoing maintenance cost and ability to maintain. Um, I guess the question I would have, and maybe this is something we could find out is, 
we're not the only ones who care about our children. Everybody in this room cares about our children, um, but there's lots of other schools and school districts making the same kinds of decisions and grappling, grappling with the same kinds of questions. I'd be curious at the, you know, through the MSBA, what other districts are choosing uh, based on, you know, they all have really smart people thinking this through. Is, is there an, is there a quick, easy way to find out what other people are making in terms of decision on this? You know, Paul, that's such a good question. I would actually say probably the best resource is the Boston Society of Architects has a really great K-12 uh, school mm -hmm. design committee, which I'm sure Denisco participates in. But I could definitely reach out to the committee chairs and ask them if they could circulate a comment, a uh, question about this, because be great. that would be, um, it's a great question. So why don't great. I plan to do that? Thank you. Okay, so Rupert has his hand up, and then Roger. Uh, thanks. I, I just want to confirm uh, what everybody else is saying about the challenges with wood chips. Um, our experience here is uh, that it's very difficult um, to keep them uh, fluffed up enough to provide the safety that we need for the children. Uh, we're talking about a foot or more of wood chips and it's very difficult to fluff them up uh, by hand. And with playground equipment, we can't really get close enough to fluff up where the biggest fall hazard is. Uh, so it is it is definitely a challenge to try and do that. Um, so I worry a lot about ongoing uh, safety for the kids for fall protection. Um, and it, I also um, uh, recognize that uh, there are some serious accessibility issues wherever you have wood chips um, and how you who, who you listen to may depend on you know is this someone that needs um, a wheelchair or is this somebody who needs a walker is this somebody with crutches they all have different issues when it comes to navigating uh, movable surfaces like wood chips especially if they're plucked up enough to actually be safe for fall protection. Uh, so yeah, it's it's very tough to imagine, for me to imagine being able to keep wood chips uh, safe and functional uh, in the long term. Thank you. Sure, Roger? Yes, I, I just wanted to, I, actually Rupert said some of the things that I was, I was thinking in terms of having spent so much time with children on the playground with wood chips, it's very difficult. And I was very interested in in sort of maintaining Doug's idea of whomever we contract, and I know Dinesco can talk about this in a way I can't, making sure what do they put in their, their rubberized surface and, and compare that with whatever it is we can get the most safe. Because wood chips are very difficult. I, I I know that Paul has said about you know the ongoing maintenance, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I know about how they get dug out, and you wish kids wouldn't hang from the dome because you can see down below that the wood chips have been um, knocked away, and there's no way of getting a rake out there and putting five more inches in. So it's it's got to be one of those things. Whatever we do decide we want to get the best quality of that material. That's all. Thank you. Okay. Allison. Um, I'd be curious um, what, because uh, one of the things that happens um, when our wood chips are not maintained, there is a higher risk of children breaking bones. And so I would like to see with port in place, are we really minimizing that occurrence if there's port in place versus wood chips? Because I just don't know the research on that. Um, also, when I look at the, um, you know, PFAS, P-F-A-S, um, I know that I was reading about the toxicity things and it's in 97% of us because of the level of this uh, this being in our environment, like basically all of us have this in us. And so 
if this is, I, I don't understand enough about the issue, but if we're talking about what a playground at one school in one town will do for the overall health of the population, when it sounds like this is so ubiquitous everywhere in our society that we're all holding this in, within our system. I just want to understand if we, I just want to understand what, where that concern is from when, if we're, are we saying that as a stance, like, are we making a point like on a, in a ideological stance, because we just want to say, oh, this is something we want to be um, marked as being against. And so we'll make a decision based on that when it's so ubiquitous and everywhere else in our environment that it's not necessarily going to change the, uh, the, how it's impacting our society. I just want to be clear about that because it feels yep. a little bit ideological at that point. Allison, just to speak to your question about the, the broken bones issue. I mean, I think based on the research I saw, the um, it's clear that the engineered wood fiber, if if in a perfect condition, is can be a very good cushion, um, probably close to the port in place. I think the port in place rubber is always going to be a little bit better, but I mean, let's say for the purposes of the discussion, they, they could be the same, that you could put in enough engineered wood fiber to be the equivalent of the port in place rubber. The issue is that it's really hard to maintain the perfect condition. And so if you are going to talk about the, the perfect condition, you know, probably, you know, you're you're going to lead towards the engineer wood fiber. But I think you've, you know, we've heard uh, folks here, you know, Roger, Rupert, um, sort of talk about the reality of that. So, um, so uh, I don't see any other hands. And I think we're now at the point, we were gonna talk about permitting, but we covered that, I think, unless, Tim or Rick have anything to add, um, we can probably uh, move to invoices. And I'm gonna turn it over to Ksenia to do that. Sure, um, I am not able to share my screen. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, I was made a co-host, so okay. I... Try yeah, now, Kathy. I just said everyone can, you should be able to now. Here we go. Yeah. Hmm. Can, you see, can you see that? Yeah. Okay, so today we have <clears throat> eight invoices to present and approve. Uh, they are two of them are for Answer Advisory and six of them are for Denisco Architects Design. Um, the um, OPM invoices add up to $64,105. The architect design invoices add up to $374,517.43, not to be forgotten. Um, mm -hmm. The OPM invoices are for the month of September and for the month of October, where the October invoice <laughs> is of signif more significant value because that's when the independent estimating work was done, um, looking at the DD set of documents. And the architectural invoices are for all for October, the September has already been paid. Um, any questions on this before I present the actual invoices? Moving on, you can stop me at any time. Um, so the, one second, like, is this big enough for everybody to see? I can a little ask. bigger, Ksenia, please. How about that? A little bigger. Even bigger. Um, we don't need to see the whole page. Whoop. You don't need to see the whole page. One second. Too many things floating around on my screen. Um, back to the invoice. That's how's, better. Yeah. How's thanks. that? Okay. All right. So this is the first of the uh, answer OPM invoices from September for 10,880. Um, it has multiple pages of notes explaining who did what for how many hours. And it includes 
no consultant backup because that's in the next one. This is the October one. Uh, we had to cut it off October 29th to try to get um, accounting closed out uh, actually on both teams in time for this meeting, which is earlier in the month than usual. Um, 22,000 for answer labor and 30,800 um, for the estimating effort for a total of 53,225. And again, with multiple pages of notes on what each person did for how many hours and what day. Um, and the reference to the estimating invoice at the bottom, followed by the yep. estimator's invoice. Um, now we get into the design team's invoice and um, this starts with uh, this horizontal landscape a summary um, and continues into the individual invoices with backup. So I'm looking down the requested this period column and the first number I come to is the construction documents um, billing. This is the first billing for developing the construction documents um, with a design development document billing having been completed last month. And this is 12 and a half percent of that effort. Um, that's the biggest part of this billing. The rest is are smaller. They are to do with reimbursable allowances. This $5,500 is for um, uh, Eversource Net Zero Consulting Services. This next one for $1,650 is for um, the ASR on a little backstop compliance. Donna can probably, or I can probably help me uh, translate ASR. Mm -hmm. um, supplemental geotechnical services, 32,751.68 and 15.07 for additional surveying work. Uh, and finally, this one for wetland permitting uh, work for 1608.75. And I will scroll through the invoices. This is the big one for the first part of CD development. Uh, Net Zero Consulting. Back up to that. Another invoice. This one is for the wetland permitting work. We'll back up to that. You can slow me down or tell me to skip stuff as you like. Um, geotechnical services invoice from Danisco with backup from their consultant. More backup to the same. Now have a Danisco invoice for the surveying work with backup from Berkshire Design Group, their surveying consultant. Danisco invoice for on the low backstop compliance assessment. Again, we're back uh, back up from Thornton Tomasetti, the consultant. And page 35 and 35. That is complete. Mm. Can I just check to see Treasurer Collector Jen has reviewed these as well, I believe, right, Jen? I have reviewed them, yes. And you're good with them? I am good with them. So I move to approve the invoices as presented. I second. Kathy, do you want me to call roll? Uh, no, I can do it. Okay. Um, okay, so um, I'm going to call committee members. Um, actually, make sure I get everyone this time. So uh, Kathy is a yes. Jen? Yes. Simone? Yes. Paul? Yes. Tammy? Yes. Rupert? Yes. Jonathan? Yes. Allison? Yes. Doug? Yes. And Roger? Yes. Um, let me just check that I know Alicia said she had to leave early and Phoebe, um, and I and Angelica, so I don't see Phoebe anymore. Is that correct? That's right. So uh, three absent and otherwise unanimous. Got it. Okay. So I think we can open up for public comment. 
And, and one thing I just want to say for those new to invoices, um, these are, as Paul said, these are being checked by the town and both Answer and Denisco are working within a budget. So when we're looking at masses of money, we're it's it's in control rather than um, what are we saying yes to? So, and these are all being documented. So I am going to turn it open to public comment. Um, and I, okay, Bruce, I have allowed you to talk. Um, thank you, Kathy. And by the way, it uh, would help if you occasionally list who the attendees are. I know on the planning board, the chair always reads the attendees at the beginning of the the public comment quest session, just so we know, everybody knows who's there, because okay. attendees don't know who's there. Everybody else can look, but we can't. Um, oh, God, my wife's about to walk in and disturb everything. So uh, uh, one question and two comments. The first comment uh, has to do with the... Uh, 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 Tim, you said that the uh, the excitement level uh, is diminishing as we head into construction documentation and permitting and all this sort of stuff. And that uh, no, no, I said I said that. <laughs> it's very exciting for Denisco. <laughs> so, but uh, one of the things that uh, I think ca can uh, replace uh, that uh, is one something we discussed uh, that was discussed in the sustainability subcommittee. And that was the, uh, the, the, the the development of a user or management policy. Um, uh, Kathy also said that the furniture and equipment design work will move in to uh, generate some uh, engagement and so forth. But I think this can as well, how the building is going to be used and the uh, uh, a group of folks who get together it was recommended in the sustainability committee who can develop uh, a user and management policy that can begin to understand and, and, and direct the the user uh, practices and and so forth and and I offered to participate in that but I'm sure others will too but I think that's an important and and stimulating uh, uh, a, a, a piece of creative uh, endeavor that can happen uh, during that time period uh, when things are slowing down in other ways. Second comment on the uh, synthetic versus the wood uh, paving. Um, it was a very interesting discussion. Uh, I've read a little bit, but not so much about this. But what came forward to me in the discussion you've just had is that I would uh, give the nod to the synthetic material because um, of the two variables that Margaret, or the two principal variables, one is the, uh, the, the, the need for maintaining accessibility on the one hand, and then the second was the the, the question of the uh, the uh, adverse health impacts of uh, of the synthetic material, um, because we know the variable related to uh, access is real, and that we have a real solution to it that is durable and reliable and tested, versus a, a, a level of uh, unknownness in relation to uh, the health impacts and so forth. In this instance, although I've been associated with trying to build healthy buildings for the bulk of my professional career, I think uh, one can't become too fixated as uh, um, uh, I think uh, uh, Alison was suggesting. Um, it can get a little too ideological. In this instance, we know there's a key important variable that we have to service and we know we can with that synthetic material. And so I think that would suggest to me that the nod goes to that surface in this instance. And then we proceed to do what Paul and others have mentioned and Doug, trying to get the best uh, uh, product in that realm by how and we how we specify and how we go about the contracting of it. Um, and finally, uh, the, the, the question, um, are we intending uh, in the uh, initial package, uh, site package, um, the wooden poles, I know I've seen those out there and we all have because we visited the site uh, a number of times. They're very tall wooden poles. And I am uh, I want to know whether there are plans to uh, salvage and reuse those poles, um, particularly the above ground, above ground portion of them because they're very tall. And, and I think you could cut them off at the base and still stick them in the ground five feet and get a, a good uh, usable uh, 
above ground abortion for a continued uh, 30 year use or something like that. So I'm, I'm uh, hopeful that uh, there are plans to salvage and reuse those wooden uh, lampstand light poles. Thank you all. Uh, as, as usual, I continue to be impressed with everything that's going on here. Thank you, Bruce. And for others' information, there are four people. Bruce was one of them. Um, and I will bring in Rudy at this point. And the other two are Maria I and Tony. Hi, here. Kathy. Can you hear, can you hear me yep. all right? Yep. Hi, here. Rudy, Rudy, Rudy Perkins Hammers. Um, I was, uh, there's a lot of things today. A lot of, uh, I'll try to be quick. Um, there was a good discussion at the sustainability committee meeting about the equipment and the need to start looking more seriously and in depth about the energy use of the various equipment we're putting into the building. I think I said something at the end of the meeting, which I'd like to walk back a little bit. And that's if the occupancy is changed in the building, if the occupancy schedules are changed, we can just fix that by putting more solar panels on. I, I suspect we'll get into EUI issues in terms of meeting the 25 EUI for our, our which we need to get from Eversource's, uh, for Eversource's subsidy. So I think we're going to have to, I suspect, and the modelers can tell us, that we're going to have to reduce our energy use more in the building in order to accommodate a possible change in the schedule that would be uh, greater public use, more hours, and so forth. So I think we need to keep drilling down on energy and the equipment is one place we need to do it because um, it's more flexible at this point in the design. I was a little uh, concerned that Donna seemed to imply that we've already generated the list of the equipment that we're likely to be using and the energy, the information technology in the building. And I don't feel like we've had any discussion really on the energy aspects of a lot of that equipment. So I hope that list, if it really has been generated, can be posted so that people can begin to look at it and think if there's other alternatives for both use and the models. Um, the things we should look at first, if we haven't already, are the things that have a dimensional impact on the building because we'll need to know that right away, like the elevator and the walk-in freezer and cooler. Um, I understand that ASHRAE recommend, recommends insulation and heating under the walk-in freezers to avoid heaving of the floors. I don't know if that's there. Maybe it's in the drawings and I haven't seen it. But the elevator, if we need to look at a different model for energy purposes, that could have dimensional impacts on the elevator shaft. So we need to look at those kind of things right away. And I hope we have more frequent sustainability subcommittee meetings to do that. Um, can we please post the opera owner's project requirements um, that was referenced in the net zero checklist? I don't think that's been posted yet. And obviously the, the equipment list, if it's been generated. Um, in terms of the, uh, let's see. So Anyway, that's that's the basic point. We need to be looking at the in, the equipment in much more detail, and I don't think we've been doing it. And I don't want to get to the point where we seem to be with some items where it's too late because other documents are going in, like with the CONCOM on this issue of the surface of the playground. Uh, in terms of the surface of the playground, I hope we post a link if we're doing any revision to this um, summary to the UMass Lowell Toxic Use Reduction Institute's playground surfacing report, because I thought that was a very useful, it's a few years old now, and it might be good to reach out to them and see if there have been changes in their conclusions about these two materials. But there's a pretty good summary of the different aspects of these two. And I'm, I'm sorry that wasn't linked along with the Children's Environmental Health Network report. So, um, Let's see. And then I'll just take us back one last time to the bylaw. The bylaw raised the energy budget in the provision in F to formulate a preliminary energy budget for the project consistent with the zero energy requirements prior to the schematic design. And that was to be done by the town and the project end users. So I think this is, this is consistent with this idea of setting up an, a, a management a net zero uh, operating committee or whatever you want to call it 
and looking at all of the equipment and energy uses and energy practices that will have to go into making the school work from the, the modeling standpoint. And I, I won't try to recap that whole discussion because it was very good on uh, a couple of days ago at the sustainability committee. So um, thanks, we need to, we, I think we need to bring the energy, my guess is we're gonna need to bring the energy down and we should do that by scrutinizing the equipment carefully. And that needs a lot of input from the staff to see what they need and what might be acceptable alternatives that use less energy. And let's start with the hardest building issues uh, first and then scrutinize a lot of the other equipment. So thanks so much. Thank you, Rudy. Maria, I have brought you in. Thank you. Um, once again, thank you to Rudy. I do find it, I'm, I appreciate that the engineered wood fiber versus poured in place is on the agenda, but it really was astonishing that you guys conducted that entire conversation and nobody brought up the Toxic Use Reduction Institute uh, out of UMass Lowell, who has done the analysis and the comparison of these materials. To, to not discuss that here, I, I just don't understand. A um, couple things to correct. We're not talking about wood chips. We're talking about engineered wood fiber. Please read Turi and please read more about that to understand that there are differences. You need to also understand that the engineered wood fiber that you get does not have to contain arsenic. There are you would not buy anything that had arsenic. So that should be an avoidable problem. However, port in place is made with crumb rubber from used tires, which contain not just PFAS, and we don't even have all the data on that, but it contains polyaromatic hydrocarbons. It contains VOCs. It contains heavy metals, including leads. It contains phthalate. It contains a host of materials that are of concern and have carcinogenic effects, respiratory effects, skin effects, heat hazards. These are all, this is known information. <laughs> when we talk about maintenance, yes, you do need to maintain any playground, including port in place. And you have to also factor into that, that we are building a building and a site that is to last at least 50 years. Port in place will not last 50 years. It's going to need to be replaced anywhere from 10 to 15 years on the shorter end if it is not maintained properly. And when it degrades, it releases these chemicals into the environment. When that crumb rubber becomes exposed, like you can check out our high school track to see what that looks like when the crumb rubber is now a free and is loose material and can be ingested. Um, please read Tori and please go back and read the, even the document that you just talked about from the Children's Health Network. Here's, here's what wasn't included in the memo where they go on to say that New York City has banned the use, this is directly from the Children's Health Environmental Network. New York City has banned the use of crumb rubber from all recreational areas in the future. A bill in Connecticut that, uh, that has been approved by the Planning and De Development Committee would impose a moratorium on all rubber surfacing. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm scrolling here on all rubber surfacing materials until clear guidance from the EPA and federal government becomes available. California and Minneapolis are also considering imposing bans on crumb rubber for use in playground <clears throat> surfaces. The information is out there. We should make a decision that is looking toward the future and for a, a net zero building to contain this, this material that is made of petrochemicals and has these risks, it, 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 it uh, I just don't get it. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Maria.
That is, uh, okay, one more person has raised their hand. Tony, you've joined us. Hi, thank you. Tony Cunningham, Owen Drive. I just wanted to um, make two comments. One on the schedule. I had sent an email through that I had noticed there were some changes in the schedule included in the design development submission to the MSBA versus a version that had been posted a week earlier. And it appeared that things got pushed back a month. Um, so I didn't hear any clarification on that today, if that is indeed the case. And uh, so the questions I was going to ask, has it been pushed back a month? Was this change reflected in the most recent cost estimates? Because I believe you use the midpoint of construction for estimating um, escalation. And is there still an expectation the school will be ready for occupancy in September 2026? And then on the discussion you had today about the playground surfacing, I would love to see more exploration done in Bob Parent's suggestion of hybrid. Um, it is a 15,000, almost a 15,000 square foot space that you're proposing, which is a huge amount of poured in place um, surfacing. And there certainly are spaces in the playground that would require greater accessibility and fall impact protection. And there are mats available, there are tiles available, or you could potentially do the poured in place in those places where impact is most needed or um, the raking of engineered wood fiber is less desirable. So if you could like at the bottom of slides, the underneath swings, um, you already see this in, in a lot of places where there's mats put in high impact areas or fall areas. So is there a potential for putting the port in place surfacing in some parts of that 15,000 square foot area and then engineered wood fiber in others? Um, there is a cost impact. It's a half a million dollars, I think. Last time I checked, I could be wrong on that. So it's a huge saving potential to reduce the amount of port in place surfacing um, to where accessibility and fall impacts are most needed. As far as the product specification, the basis of design has specified a product since the beginning. It's Surface America's Playbound product. So unless there are other products that the designers are aware of that they would consider, Every cost estimate that I can tell has based their estimate on this Playbound um, PIP product. Uh, as far as mold growth, it says in the materials, it's unlikely if drainage is adequate. And I believe Danisco is planning on putting proper drainage under the playground. So I wouldn't anticipate um, the insects and mold being a concern if it's done correctly. Um, and then I'm a little concerned about the comment about because PFAS is already in our environment, we shouldn't worry about putting more in. I don't, I'm not aware of definitive studies yet that have linked PFAS to PIP, but there are studies under underway. Um, be, as Rick correctly said, there's like 6,000 or more types of PFAS and there's only testing for about 20 or 30 of those types. And uh, we know it's in crumb rubber. So it's likely PFAS is in it, but it, I, I'm not aware that there's been a direct link studied and reported on yet, but that's the suspicion. And the fact that it's in our environment, adding more should not be something that we pursue, especially in a building that's supposed to be cutting edge as far as environmental and health and climate aspects. It seems um, to be inconsistent to knowingly put in a petrochemical product that, that potentially contains harmful, well, we know contains harmful um, environmental and safety aspects. And then the heat thing is a real concern that Angelica commented on. There's, I don't think there's any plans for shade or trees over these, over this playground, 15,000 square foot baking in the sun. So I think heat will be a concern. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to speak and I will put my hand down now. Thank you, Tony. We don't have any other hands up from the public. Does anyone on the committee have final questions or comments? Um, it might, um, as far as I know, we are on schedule to open the school. 
in September 2026. But, yeah. but we we will confirm all the timelines. Margaret gave you the the peace timelines, but we will confirm them all at the December 8th meeting and um, including key points on like when the old school gets demolished. Um, that is all in the plan. Um, so I don't know whether anyone else has comments. If you do have comments or questions, including the reports that have been mentioned, I we we can respond. We can put more material into the packet. Yeah, and there's a there's a couple of takeaways. I think people have made good comments. We can follow up, and it, this will be on the agenda for the December meeting. So, so I want to thank everyone, and it is amazingly it's ten thirty, which was a a target stopping time. And um, please let me know if you cannot make. December 8th, and then I will poll on the January, the two January dates. Um, and um, other than that, I wish you all a very good Thanksgiving, because we won't meet as a group until after Thanksgiving holidays. So again, thank you very much. We are adjourned. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye. Bye-bye.